The K63 wireless mechanical gaming keyboard from Corsair can connect to your computer via ultra-fast 1 millisecond 2.4 gigahertz wireless technology or low latency Bluetooth and features per-key blue LEDs, 15 hours of gameplay on a single charge, and genuine Cherry MX switches. It's lapboard ready too, so click the sponsor link in the description for more information. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A series. This is actually my Probing Paul episode for March of 2018, although this might be posted at the very beginning of April, so sorry about that. But uh, you guys asked me questions. Uh, these questions were all taken from the comment section of last month's video, so last uh, month was episode 22. Uh, so if you guys wanna ask me questions for next month, then feel free to do so down in the comment section of this video. And so the cycle continues on and on into the future. Uh, but let's just jump right into it here and start ask, answering questions. Uh, most of these are questions. Some of them are responses from me about other things. But first off, Marcus Palm says, great video as always. Do you do all your editing yourself? Uh, thank you, Marcus. And the answer is no, I do not. Actually, I have an editor who I work with. Uh, his name is Joe. And if you're ever curious whether Joe edited the video or I edited the video, you can go into any video that's been uploaded by me and go to the description and hit show more. Scroll past all my links and stuff. And down here you can see, uh, I should almost always say it's edited by Joe. It's got a link to his Facebook page. And then down here under editor, you can actually go straight to his YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Uh, everyone go subscribe to Joe. He does he does metal, metal videos and stuff like that. But yeah, on Joe's channel, he does uh, just, just random little things that he pops up from time to time. He's done some editing tutorials and that kind of thing, which is cool as well. But Joe's a great editor. I've been working with him for several years now, and he's much faster at it than I am, which is which is very good, because I'm very slow when I edit. Usually, I will record stuff here, and then I'll take the footage and I'll transcode it um, with my editing PC here, and then I send it to him via BitTorrent Sync, or Resilio Sync, I guess it's called now, and then he edits, and then he sends me back a project file. I take the project file, I load it up in Premiere, uh, attach all of my uncompressed video footage, and then I'll do a final kind of run through, maybe change a few things here and there, and then render it all out. Uh, alternatively, he has actually been coming over to help me make videos uh, once a week or so, and when he does that, he's able to just take the raw footage himself, which is which is nice. But uh, Joe, if you happen to watch this, thank you for all of your excellent work you've done for me, and to anyone who's watching, uh, go go follow Joe on Twitter too. He's also got a Twitter, and tell him I sent you. A quick aside though, you might notice some background noise in this video. Uh, there's a train going by right now and there's also a neighbor who's doing some sort of strange construction work, so my apologies for that. But let's move on to the next question. This one's from Solid State Tech, and he asked, why isn't VRAM upgradable on GPUs like regular DRAM is? Uh, he says he thinks he's seen some before, but not for a long time. Uh, it's a good question and probably something that lots of people would want to do. Say buy a GTX 1062 gig and then pop an extra two gigs of VRAM onto there and upgrade yourself in the future. But video Cards typically when they're sold are all self-contained. The DRAM or the GDDR uh, RAM modules are soldered to the PCB, which makes it extremely difficult for an end user to remove them and replace them or anything like that. Also, it's worth pointing out that uh, most GPUs uh, have a fair level of uh, technical knowledge and engineering that go into them, and they do try to pair the GPU, as far as the what it's capable of, with a reasonable amount of VRAM, and they do that sometimes to give the GPU the best performance they can, and then they also do that sometimes to segments. So, for instance, that's why you have a GTX 1062 gig and a GTX 1064 gig, and one is more expensive than the other. But there's actually a little bit more to this question, and I wanna here point out that um, a lot of times people go into my videos and put responses themselves, so I want to give a shout out to Brandishwar who posted a reply uh, to that original comments and uh, put a link to a Quora, giving a, some back and forth on that. But also he linked to very specifically the Dell Matrox, or a Dell Matrox 8 meg PCI graphics card that I wanted to show you guys. This is actually for sale over on stuartconnections.com for $12. Uh, it's a Dell Matrox 8 megabyte PCI video card, and there's other video cards I believe that have had this capability as well, but what you got down here is an SO DIMM slot, so you can, with this graphic graphics card, pop, pop in uh, an SODIMM uh, RAM upgrade and then upgrade your video memory. Now you can't do that with modern graphics cards for a couple other reasons as well. 
GDDR5, GDDR5X memory runs hotter. Uh, at least the modules themselves can run hotter than typical VRAM. So usually there'll be some sort of integrated cooling solution that helps keep the VRAM modules uh, cool. And then there's also the possibility of degradation of performance. Typically, if you're looking at a VRAM pool for a graphics card, it's all gonna be running the same type of memory running at the same speed in order for that graphics card to operate efficiently. And uh, mixing and matching different types of memory is going to hurt or impact your performance. The best modern day comparison here that you could make is if you're looking at something like an APU, like uh, AMD's new Raven Ridge APUs, they use integrated system memory for their VRAM memory buffer. That allows you to go in and flexibly change, for example, you want 256 megs set aside or 512 or a gig or two gigs for the GPU specifically. The upshot is that the memory it's using is system memory, which is not tuned for video tasks the same way that GDDR5 memory is, not to get too specific about it. So if Nvidia did decide to make an upgradable GTX 1080 or something like that, the amount of variation of different types of memory that could go in there, the complexity of creating a socketed form factor to where you could slot something in or remove it, would just be too challenging and not make sense when it comes to production costs. Again, this is the type of thing that you've seen companies attempt in the past, and if they've attempted it in the past, and then now they've decided, no, that's not a good way of doing it, it usually means either the product didn't do well, or it just wasn't making enough money to be profitable. So hopefully that answers your question. Next question from Viloco3 uh, says, welcome back, Paul, long way to return. If you guys recall last month, uh, was after I had sort of been on hiatus for a while. Uh, he says, I would love to see some 3D printing videos from you. And I did kind of briefly mention this uh, in, in the last probing, Paul, but 3D printing, yeah. I find it interesting and it's something that I've wanted to dive into and um, I'd like to just set up a 3D printer somewhere here in the garage in the background. I really, that's as far as I've gone with it. I've thought about it. I've given it, given it some consideration and I've thought, oh, like I know Jerry uh, Barnacle's Nergasm and he could probably help me out with that and get me pointed in the right direction. Um, at this point, I don't have anything further to add to that. I haven't really made any progress in that area, but it is something I'm still interested in. So if you guys have any suggestions for me, uh, feel free to leave those in the comment section and uh, hopefully I'll pick up on those because yeah, I wanna get that set up pretty soon. Next question from Nakir says, I'm looking forward to building a system using one of the new Ryzen 2400G APUs, but I know Ryzen can be picky about what RAM it works with. What should I pay more attention to? Any info I can find on the processor's compatibility or that for the motherboard? Uh, this is actually, it's not like a, a one or the other type thing. It's an A then B thing. So if you already know that you want a Ryzen APU with 2200G or 2400G, those use AM, those, those slot into the AM4 socket. So you want an AM4 socket motherboard from AMD. And then second, you want to make sure that the motherboard you buy is updated. So it says it's uh, Ryzen Raven Ridge ready or uh, Ryzen 2400G, 2200G ready. Different uh, advertisements have had different stickers that go on there. Newegg uh, in some of the listings I've shown has had a little bit of extra text there that says it's compatible. Just so you know that the motherboard you're buying has been updated to be compatible with these new uh, APUs. Once that's sorted, then you wanna look at the memory. And for that, I would say, now that you've chosen your motherboard uh, based on the socket and compatibility and probably maybe looks and features and uh, price, of course, also goes into that decision. But once you've chosen your motherboard, then you wanna go and look at your motherboard manufacturer's website like Gigabyte or Asus or ASRock or that kind of thing. Go to the QVL list, uh, qualified vendor list, I believe is what that stands for. There'll be a memory compatibility chart. And there you can see specifically the memory modules that that motherboard manufacturer has tested with that motherboard with a, a Ryzen CPU to make sure that the memory is compatible. And um, that will give you the best bet at making sure that that memory you can get will slot in, you can plug in the XMP settings and be off to the races. And yes, having decently fast memory, I go for 2933, 3000 speed or faster uh, with Ryzen to get, give yourself the best performance. Hopefully that helps you. The next question is not a question. It is a response, and this was, uh, again, from last month when I was talking about monitor calibration. And I was talking about monitor calibration from the point of view of someone who produces content to post on the internet. Uh, Jim Cole here posted a lengthy response just indicating, you know, it's not just about me and what people like me happen to do, uh, but he is actually very informative and pointed out a few other things. For example, uh, calibrating a monitor to produce print work is very important. So consider that as well, as opposed to just viewing stuff on the screen. He actually pointed out, for example, when he is doing print work, uh, he might have different ambient lighting in the room. Uh, different ambient lights 
change the perceived color effect on the screen. So when he's doing photo work, he does a dark room. When he's working with Illustrator and Design, uh, he does a brighter room so that the paper, the look on the paper after it's printed, will look more natural. He also points out that monitors change over time and it's not necessarily a set and forget type thing. So it's very important if you're doing professional work to go back every three months. He says every one to three months, uh, which seems like a reasonable time frame to me, to recheck your monitor, make sure none of the colors have shifted and make sure that whatever you're producing in a professional environment is going to print well and be re-represented -re well wherever you happen to be sending your digital artwork. There were one or two other comments about this last month. Uh, one of them specifically said, why don't you just, rather than buying a monitor calibration tool, get your monitor and look up other calibrations that, because uh, people can take a calibration profile with some monitors and upload it, and you can find someone else who has your exact same monitor and just take their profile. There is uh, a caveat to that as well, though, because each panel is different. If, mother, if monitor manufacturers could calibrate each panel I perfectly at the factory, then no one would ever need a, a monitor calibration tool in order to make sure that it's reproducing colors properly. Just like with a CPU, there's slight variations that might affect your overclocking performance. With a monitor, there's slight variations in the manufacturing process that might affect the actual color reproduction of the monitor itself. So Jim, thank you for uh, posting that and being informative and letting me and a few other people know a little bit more about that topic. Just uh, one or two more questions here to go. So this one's from Second to Last Jedi. He says, hey, Paul, I've asked this to you and a few other PC experts. No one has given an answer. He's got a unique memory configuration. He has a two by four gig, 2400 speed kit and a one by eight gig, 2133 speed kit overclocked to 2400. He's also using a GTX 1080 Ti and an Intel Skylake 6600K. He's wondering about an upgrade to a two by eight gig, 3200 kit how beneficial would it be and would it affect his performance with 4K and with VR? Now there's a slow rolling train outside, but I'm gonna still proceed. Beyond the dual channel versus single channel question, you also have a speed question. You have 2400 speed memory and then you have an eight gig stick that you've overclocked a little bit to also match 2400. Um, typically, your memory is gonna run at the lowest common denominator of speed. So um, the fact that you were able to overclock your eight gig, gig stick, that's good. That meant that you're able to run all of your memory at 2400 speed. And uh, your, your changes, if you go for an upgrade, are gonna be, you're gonna enable dual channel by going with two by eight gig kit. You're still gonna have 16 gigs overall, so that won't change your overall capacity. And you should be able to run it at 3200 speed with that kit and with this processor, so that shouldn't be a problem either. Now the things that you're gonna be logically considering are the fact that single to dual channel doesn't always give a big performance boost. Uh, the biggest performance boost I've seen is when you're pairing it with an AMD APU, one of the Raven Ridge uh, APUs recently, in which case you definitely want dual channel mode, but since you're using uh, an Intel platform, a Skylake platform, it's probably not gonna be that big of a difference to you. Also, the increase in memory speed from 2400 to 3200, again, will improve performance, but to what degree and how much is gonna change based on what you're doing with it. Now we're talking about 4K and VR here, so obviously you're trying to push a uh, pretty high resolution and task your GPU with some pretty important things. So I would say you want all the speed you can get. Uh, if you're looking into this right now, memory is very expensive. So I'd definitely consider selling your two by four gig kit and your one by eight gig kit and replacing that complete with, with your new two by eight gig kits. And if you can sell at high prices and buy back at high prices, then hopefully you won't be losing too much money overall. So yes, you might see just a marginal gain going from what your current setup is to the two by eight gig setup. Um, but I would go for it anyway. It's gonna be a cleaner setup. You'll be better suited for those uh, high-end tasks that you want your uh, computer to be able to do. And um, I, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say when it comes to pricing, whether you should buy now or wait, um, but memory pricing sucks, I guess. All right, I have two more questions, actually. There's, this one's from Muito de Ora. Uh, this actually wasn't posted on the Q&A video last month. It was posted on the video I posted yesterday because I was, my house was dusty. Hold on, let me show you guys. This is, uh, does your PC even need a case? I'll post a link to this in the video's description if you want to, but I, t I tried to point out to people that I very intentionally did not dust prior to doing this video. And we do dust out in the living room at least once a week, if not once every couple weeks. I don't dust the computer itself, like the motherboard and everything, but around it on like the console and the shelves and everything like that, I do dust. So um, I just want to point it out that I spent a bunch of time cleaning yesterday because I felt self-conscious because everyone was giving me a hard time about the dust and now it is much cleaner. I just wanted to prove that to you guys that I don't live in a 
in a hovel uh, with contaminants everywhere. Um, but it's a constant battle, especially with the dogs. All right, one last question here. Uh, this one's from Sam Samuel782. He says, have you ever given anyone the Heimlich maneuver? No pun intended. And this is, of course, a reference to my last name, which is Heimlich. Uh, the German spelling, and uh, I get this question asked a lot when whenever I tell people my last name. I've never actually given it. I've never had to do the Heimlich maneuver on someone. I am familiar with how you do it and stuff like that. Uh, we used to have like a a chart and stuff um, when I was growing up in our in our in our pantry. But I do want if for any of you who are looking for further reading, uh, here here you go. Henry Heimlich is the inventor of the Heimlich maneuver. There's a picture. Uh, he actually died just a couple years ago in 2016, uh, and, and you can read about him I'll, if you guys really want to. Fun fact, I am told that um, my family uh, history, my family tree, goes all the way back to Germany, and that I am, a, I am an actual Heimlich, going way, way back to whenever my uh, ancient German family decided that should be their name. Whereas Henry Heimlich, uh, uh, the inventor of the Heimlich Maneuver, actually assumed the name um, but I'm not even 100% sure about that. That could just be, could all be made up. But that's all the time I have for today, guys. I hope you've enjoyed watching Probing Paul. Uh, I'll be back again next month, which probably isn't going to be very long since it's already April now uh, with another one. So, of course, leave questions in the comment section down below if you have any for me. And uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to ask me stuff in the meantime. I've got more videos coming up this week, so hit the thumbs up button on your way out. And as always, thank you very much for watching.